Welcome everyone to a brand new festival for Orpington. Ways with Words is a literary festival brought to you in collaboration between the Rotary and Orpington First Business Improvement District. For those of you that live locally and work locally, you'll know that Orpington has always been a, a place where festivals are celebrated, from cycling to children to arts to music. But we wanted to bring something new, particularly with the reopening of the high street and the roadmap that we're following. So having spent some time talking about what we could do, um, we came up with a literary festival as we felt that this had the most expansive reach. And actually there's already a lot of activity that goes on in Orpington. And we could use this festival to bring in new things, but also to promote the vast amount of activities and events that are already in place for you to join in. This is the first um, event of a two week festival. It starts on Monday the 24th and runs through until the 5th of June. Please visit, visit the website uh, to find out all of the activities that you can join in from children's trails, children's activities, health and wellbeing, etc. And um, so do please keep in touch. I'm delighted that for this first event, we are joined by our very own MP, Member of Parliament, Gareth Bacon. So welcome. Thank you. What we'd like to do is just um, talk to you a little bit about your own experience in, in terms of reading. Um, what influences you most and, and perhaps some of the, the books that we can see on your shelf behind you. Mm. So um, if we start at the sort of beginning, how were you introduced to reading as a child? Well, my my mum in particular used to read to me um, when she was small. I mean, I, I was in the fortunate position that both of my parents are teachers, so um, they were very keen that I learned to read as soon as possible. And uh, I remember when I went to primary school, they used to teach us back in those days, which was sort of the early 1970s, we had these little tins of words, former tobacco tins, I think they were, and we had uh, different words on them on a piece of card that we would have to learn uh, and bring back in and be able to recite and spell. And we had various um, books as well, Janet and John, I remember being uh, one of the uh, sort of simple ladybird type books. Mm -hmm. um, and I had lots of those at home as well. Uh, and then I progressed on to things like Enid Blyton and things like that and, and read uh, lots and lots of her stories because she had such a wide range of stories as well. And uh, reading was something that I took to very early. Um, back in those days, of course, there were no such things as um, Xboxes or electronic games or anything like that. So other than television, and when I was growing up, there were only three channels on television. There were no videos. Uh, nothing like that. Reading was your way of escaping. It was your way of um, discovering a new world. And uh, I took to that very early on. Uh, and it's something I still do. I mean, I read all the time. Um, I mean, part of my job, I have to read a lot anyway, but I also read for pleasure. So is there a, a book or a particular book or character that stands out for you in terms of your childhood? Yeah, I, when I was very small, um, once I started reading Enid Blyton books, I mean, um, Noddy was one of my favourites when I was young, but uh, <laughs> then I moved on to, she used to have, the, the, she had this series called uh, The Something of Adventure. It would be The Castle of Adventure, the, uh, the, there were other uh, adventure books as well. Um, and those were very good because uh, when I was sort of six or seven, they were really quite exciting. Uh, and then things like The Faraway Tree, uh, things that I read. Uh, when I was 11, I read a, a book called I Am David, uh, which was about uh, a refugee who escaped from a prisoner of war camp um, and it was never as precise about where that was or when that was but I always assumed it was during World War II and it was a German prisoner of war camp it escaped from and that was actually quite a moving book and um, it sort of went on from there really and as I say I read an awful lot I mean uh, when I was a bit younger uh, I decided to try and make a list of all the books that I'd read but I just couldn't possibly do that because there were too many and I couldn't remember half of them. No, it's great. I think a lot of people have actually been enticed back to reading during um, the COVID experience that we've all mm. gone through. Um, and there's nothing better than going into a local bookshop and actually finding something that, you know, is going to enlighten you or entertain mm. you. Um, oh, very much so. I mean, I, I think uh, nowadays mo most of my reading comes from my Kindle. Uh, because of course you they're, they're, they weigh next to nothing and you can carry hundreds of books around them at any time and they it doesn't matter if they get wet so when I go on holiday I always load the Kindle up with four or five books and and you know I could drop it in the pool and it would be fine but I actually like the feel of books um, I, I they, they look great on your shelves that are you know my, mine behind me yours behind you um, and when I was at university uh, again this is pre the internet age um, you had to actually physically get books out of the library in order to do your studies and I always like the feel and the smell and the texture of books. Yeah, there's something romantic about it, isn't there? I think that, that comes to mind. Um, so having two teachers as parents was obviously a fantastic start. Um, you have children yourself. How did you encourage them into reading or was it just a natural thing that they did? 
A uh, bit of both, really. Um, I mean, my wife started reading, <laughs> reading to our daughter when she was still pregnant. Um, <laughs> and then from the moment that she was born, she had books around her. So obviously, when you're, you're very small, when you're a baby, the books tend to be very pictorial. Um, and they're, they're they're very thick so not not on paper they're on on card uh so we, we had that and then she progressed quite rapidly after that i read her the entire series of harry potter um that Ooh. became her bedtime stories I, i'd resisted harry potter up to that point um and uh she she started to show signs of interest of it when she was in primary school so i, I bought all the books and read them uh, which took us a few months in time for us to go and see the final harry potter film when it came out in the cinema which was really great Excellent. I mean, a lot of people have said to us during this process of, of putting the festival together um, how audio books have actually come to um, the, the fore for them. And that mm. um, particularly as, as you get older, maybe you're having to wear glasses all the time like me, um, that actually it's very relaxing just to sit back and actually have someone tell you a story. And it does mm. remind you of when you're younger um, mm. and people are actually reading to you. And um, we want to promote the fact that there's lots of audio books available, whether it's just for pleasure or whether it is because you can't read yourself and you actually mm -hmm. need that. Mm. Um, and in the same way, I suppose, in terms of access for books, Braille books as well, which are also available. Um, and it's something that everyone can actually join in with. Mm. Um, so, yeah, very interesting. Um, you mentioned about your bookshelf. Um, I mm. think what Zoom meetings have done is actually um, sort of created a fashion for curating your bookshelf behind mm. you, although I haven't done that myself, <laughs> um, for a backdrop, something that uh, your bookshelf tells uh, the audience about you, if you like, and, and reflects you. So what mm. sort of books <clears throat> do you actually have on your bookshelf? Well, I, I'm very interested in history. So um, lo lots of the books that I've got are either history books or history, historical fiction. Um, uh, I like lots of that. I'm also, I mean, the ones that you can probably see over my shoulder over this side um, are uh, biographies of former prime ministers. Um, I, I, I mean, I read lots of biographies of people. I find that very, very interesting, particularly political ones. Some of the sporting ones are less interesting because I think when you're reading a sporting biography, you want to know what it's like to be that person. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, 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 they don't really give you that. Um, so there's lots of history. There's, there's some politics on there as well. Things like one of my other uh, deep interests is uh, space exploration, particularly mm -hmm. uh, when America uh, went to the moon. So I've got lots and lots of stuff about that as well. So a so mixture of history, historical fiction, politics um, and other things. There are some other fiction and, and things like that. Ancient Rome is something I'm also quite interested in. So I've got some stuff on that too. So wide ranging, certainly. And what book are you actually reading at the moment? Are you, are you somebody that reads one at a time or do you have several books on the go? I, funny enough, normally I only have one, one at a time, but at the moment mm -hmm. I'm reading two different books. Uh, the one that I'm reading mostly at the moment is, is this one, um, which is about the Duke of Wellington. Um, and this is a this is that that's the second volume of a two volume set. I've already read the first volume. Uh, the Duke of Wellington is one of my historical heroes, um, and this is probably the best biography that I've come across about him. It's tremendously detailed, but it's extremely readable at the same time. And I've mm -hmm. actually found out things in it that I didn't know about before, which is is quite good. So um, on to something slightly um, more political, I suppose, in terms of uh, your position. Um, Covid has, I suppose, deprived many people many children of a normal education over the last 12 months and it has raised concerns about the sort of literary standards and levels um mm. can you tell us a little bit about what the government's sort of putting in place to support children not just catching up <coughs> but how we're mm. actually going to start raising literary skill standards as we go forward well quite a lot of extra funding is going in uh, to support that so um, over a three-year period up until 2023 the government's put an extra 14 billion pounds into that and they've raised that by another 1.7 for the catch-up side of it so it's a, a billion pound catch-up uh, package which is going to be delegated to head teachers and it's up to them uh, to decide how they spend it and I think that's probably right because head teachers are closer to it than anybody uh, working in Westminster or Whitehall. Uh, there's also money going into a, a national tutoring program um, and the aim for that is to benefit um, the most disadvantaged children because I think one of the things that we've seen over this pandemic uh, is that uh, families that are slightly better off will have access to things like laptops and, and wi-fi and they can be taught remotely but of course those who are less uh, well off that's not necessarily the case. And, and I think particularly uh, the more deprived children or the more disadvantaged children, uh, there's a great danger that they're falling behind. So the government is trying to do something about that by putting money into the tutoring programme and also in funding things like uh, remote learning through laptops and things like that. So um, we're not through the pandemic yet. So these are things mm -hmm. that are going to help us 
get to that but also um other things which uh, may or may not be popular with children and teachers is um things like longer school days uh, maybe five year, five term school year changes to some holidays all of these things are being looked at no decisions have been taken on those um, but i think the most important thing we, we need to get people back on track because uh, the last sort of 14 15 months has put a big hole i think in lots of kids education and there's not much that most people could do about that but now that we know more about the pandemic now that we are pulling through it the key thing now is to get everybody back on track. So, as you say, access to books is something that um, perhaps from a, a less affluent background, it, it's harder. Mm. But one of the things that we hope the festival will promote is access to reading, whether it's through mm. the library, whether it's through um, books from the charity shops. Um, our charity shops in Orpington still do take books. Many don't um, because mm. they're obviously quite heavy to, to use. But this um, two week period, we'll be promoting that Explore Learning is a facility in Orpington that's actually got lots of online um, literary skills. Um, and so I think there's a lot of activity there if, if people can actually come and visit the website and to see what, what is available. Uh, WH Smith at the moment has got um, a campaign for accessing books, a campaign that's actually fronted by Marcus Rashford, who's mm -hmm. been doing quite a lot, um, apart from playing football. So um, we'd, we'd ask people to come and visit the town and actually support some of those initiatives that, that are going on. Um, the Ways with Words Festival it aims to celebrate both the written and the spoken word. So whether you're um, listening to a reading, a performance, it's as valuable in some ways as um, reading a book. One of the most significant performances that you've made in your career must be your maiden speech in Parliament. Mm. Um, how did you go about actually writing that? How did you um, structure it? And what were you most conscious about when you, when you actually performed that in Parliament? <laughs> Okay, well, um, the thing that I was most conscious about, um, the, the maiden speech is, it's, it's like a hurdle you have to clear uh, as a new member of parliament. And it's, the thing that I was most conscious of is that it's my first time uh, saying anything at all in the national parliament representing my local constituents. So I was a bit anxious not to make a complete mess of it. Um, the, the truth of it is that um, maiden speeches aren't widely watched. Almost nobody remembers anybody's maiden speech, apart from you yourself, maybe your relatives, and some of your constituents um, will watch it. And, and I uh, put mine out on social media so that people could see it. So I wanted to make sure it was okay. Uh, in terms of the structure, uh, you're helped there, really. Um, it, it's In some ways, it's the easiest speech you'll ever make in Parliament because the structure is traditional. So in any maiden speech, um, a, a new MP, will they will do three things. So they'll talk about their predecessor, normally kindly. Um, <laughs> they'll describe their constituency. Um, and again, that, that's normally focusing on the positive parts of your constituency. And the third thing is whatever the debate of the day is, what, whatever debate you're taking part in, obviously you will talk a bit about that as well. So in my case, um, the debate of the day was about local government funding, which is something that um, I know uh, a wee bit about because uh, I, I come from a, a career in local, local government. So th that was fine. Um, talking about my predecessor, Joe Johnson, uh, was okay as well. Um, and then talking about the constituency, um, you know, I'd, I'd been campaigning in it for, for weeks and weeks uh, prior to getting elected. I live very, uh, very near. So uh, all of these things were quite okay. So the key thing really was condensing it um, so because what you don't want to do is, is stand up and drone on for uh, 20 or so minutes a good maiden speech they say is somewhere between six and ten minutes um, and I was a bit concerned that I might speak for too long and the last thing you want is the mm. speaker to stand up and say right you need to stop now because that's mm. spoiled your maiden speech <laughs> so making sure that the timing was right uh, was, an, was another key thing um, so getting through it not making a mess of it not telling myself while I was doing it you're standing in the house of commons because that's the other thing mm. you could sort of get stage fright and freeze a wee bit <laughs> It's a bit, I, I equate it to a tennis player playing at Wimbledon for the first time. Um, you've got to, if you're on the centre court, don't think this is the centre court. It's just another tennis court. You've played thousands of games of tennis. This is just another one. Uh, and you know, same thing, really speaking, in the House of Commons. I've spoken many times. I just need to tell myself it's not the House of Commons. Just, just um, get on with it. Get it done speak mm. slowly because uh, that's the other thing if you're nervous you tend to garble um, and, and so that's how I did it. Excellent well we certainly listened to it and we're delighted that you mentioned Orpington Bid in your maiden speech. Indeed. So uh, we've actually got that on our channel and uh, we play it often. <laughs> um, I suppose that the sort of the spoken word um, is something that we've also touched on that, that we're trying to, to present and to, to celebrate and we have managed to secure um, the recovery po uh, poem which is an art installation that the Arts Council um, has sort of funded that's touring the country. And it will be coming to Orpington on June the 4th. 
in a beautiful poem. It's about the um, the challenges of the last 12 months and the hope that people have for the future and the sort of positive things that come from it. And it lights up at night and it's, you know, it's quite a nice installation to, to actually be part of. And we'll have poets there who are actually going to be performing alongside it. Um, and we've also spoken to some schools who are the children are actually writing poems as well. So anyone who wants to come and actually uh, test themselves out in terms of performing to the wider public, um, mm. we welcome them along and I'm um, happy to have them in town. Um, as the local MP, you must be delighted that Orpington Library remains um, a really good facility and is in the heart of the town centre. Mm. Um, it's undergone some redevelopment. Um, there's some new facilities there including the business hub, which is going to be uh, really useful to us and the work that we do. Um, how do you see the library working? What do you see for the future with libraries? Well, I think uh, libraries um, are tremendous community resources. <clears throat> um, I mean, one of the things my father always did and still does actually is go to the library fairly regularly and bring back four or five library books, which he will read and then and drop off and, and change. Um, I think library use is changing. It's not just about books anymore. Um, much greater uh, digitization of the service I think is inevitable and I think is good and I think needs to be ramped up they can also be slightly more community-minded spaces so they're used not just for taking books in and out sometimes uh, I mean I haven't done this yet but uh, colleagues often have their uh, advice surgeries in libraries uh, because people come their counselors I know um, do that as well so there's, there's a lot more to a library than just a warehouse for books now it's much more of a community hub uh, and I think with the digitization of libraries the reach is is significantly wider because people can actually reach into the library without actually having to walk into the room. So I, I see them being with us um, for a very long time to come, um, but I see their service modernising and changing slightly according to the needs of the users. Excellent. I think that probably um, summarises what's happening to Orpington Town Centre, actually, mm. as we undergo um, a huge development in the future and how we're trying to put the community at the heart of that. Yes. Um, business is going to be vital and, and building the economy, but we, we can only do that if we're actually in sync with our local community. Mm. Um, and having that facility right in the heart of the town is something that um, gives us great confidence for the future. I mean, very much so. I mean, libraries are, are anchor points for, for any uh, any town, really, any 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 high street. Uh, and I think, you know, with the redevelopment of the town centre that is, is pending in the next few years, it's absolutely vital that the library is retained. Uh, mm. It's a key part, or will be a key part of the town now and in the future. And we're also delighted that we've got such a good um, collaboration, I suppose, between both um, ourselves, the local authority, the community groups, people like the Rotary, um, all coming together with um, something that they can share and actually evolve. And um, we hope that this festival is something that we can really build on. So we would um, welcome comments from um, the wider community so things that you would like to see in next year's event this is very much a trial this year mm. um but please let us know um speak to your councillors your mp uh, anyone else about the types of things that you would like us to include and how we can actually build a really strong well-skilled and, and well-united sort of community going forward uh, based on literacy that, that affects all of us so um thank you for joining us um, my pleasure we hope to see you at one of the events in the next two weeks. Um, but thank you very much for um, welcoming and opening this very important first event for us. So thank oh, it's you. my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. And uh, very best of luck. This is a, this is a really good innovation. Um, so very best of luck with it. And I will certainly see you there. Thank you.